I'm delighted to welcome you all to this session. Um, it's a bit of a Ron Seal session, does what it says on the tin, making of a mega doc. Um, it's part of Broadcast's 60th anniversary celebrations. I'd like to thank PACT and Screen Skills for their support for all our B60 activity throughout the year. Um, the plan for today is twofold. We are going to assess the appetite for features docs in general and talk a little bit about why in-depth storytelling is so in vogue and so potent at the moment. Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit more specifically about four different films and the stories behind them. Before we do that, let's meet the panelists. We had a slight change of uh, lineup uh, today, and, and I'll explain as we, as we go through. Um, so immediately to my left and your right is Dan Reed, who runs Amos Pictures and is the director of high profile projects such as The Valley, Terror in Mumbai, and The Pedophile Hunter. His latest film, Leaving Neverland, uh, is an epic investigation into Michael Jackson's abuse of two boys told through the eyes of the victims. Um, and just before the festival, I, I was told by a press release, it's been sold to 180 territories around the world. 194. 194 territories. They've just, <laughs> they've just done 14 more deals. Um, but that's effectively everywhere. It's almost literally um, everywhere. So, Except China. China. Except China. <laughs> Talk to your distributor. <laughs> Make them work a bit harder. Um, next up, Danny Gabay is uh, head of Vice Studios US and executive vice president uh, at parent company Vice Media. Vice's recent feature productions include uh, Harmony Kareem's The Beach Bum, uh, Jim and Andy The Great Beyond for Netflix, and the Emmy-nominated Fire, The Greatest Party That Never Happened, which uh, generated a huge amount of buzz earlier this year. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, next up, we have uh, Simon Chin and Poppy Dixon. Uh, Simon is a double Oscar-winning producer, which is nice. Um, with credits including Searching for Sugar Man and Louis Theroux's My Scientology movie. Uh, he runs Lightbox uh, with his LA-based cousin Jonathan, um, and uh, he and Poppy are here to talk primarily about Untouchable, um, which is Ursula McFarlane's piece on the rise and fall of serial predator and movie mogul Harvey Weinstein. Um, Ursula, unfortunately, can't be with us today. Um, Poppy, who um, also produced Untouchable, has a very enviable list of credits, including American Animals and Three Identical Strangers. <sighs> Keep going. Um, and finally, uh, Naveen Mabro is a deputy editor of Channel 4 News, and she was an exec on uh, For Summer, the um, film that Wad al Kataib uh, uh, produced um, for Channel 4. Um, Naveen played a, a sort of key role in the in Channel 4 News, striking up a slightly unusual relationship um, uh, with uh, Ward, um, who unfortunately, again, can't be uh, with us here today. We'll talk a bit about how For Summer came to be um, later on. Before we talk specifics about your individual projects, I wanted to begin by sort of testing the, the water a little bit. Um, the hypothesis is that there is a appetite for real stories told in depth, uh, a greater appetite for those kind of stories perhaps than, than ever before, and that, that more of these kind of feature docs are breaking through um, into the mainstream and, and creating real buzz. I wonder if you would accept that hypothesis. Simon, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, I think I broadly accept the <laughs> thesis. Um... And what's behind it? Well, I think, you know, it sounds a bit of an obvious cliche to say it, but I guess the one word that comes to mind is Netflix. I mean, that is very reductive, but I mean, Netflix has been at the vanguard in terms of SVODs of, of sort of acquiring and now financing feature docs in a way that they haven't been before by a single entity. So, I mean, we've always had... HBO, Showtime, they've always been those sort of cable buyers mm -hmm. who've, who, in the US who've kind of had an appetite for, for, for feature docs, but they've always been, you know, pretty picky. Um, and, you know, there's always been a sort of theatrical market. Well, not always, but I mean, for the past 20 years, there's been a theatrical market for feature docs. You know, I made Man on Wire, you know, 11, I think it came out 11 years ago, and it did very well. Discovery, actually, were, were a financier of that. So, you know, it's not as if some, 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 something 
brand new is happening. Um, but what is happening is, is that there, is, there are just now, Netflix has created competition that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. um, I guess partly among uh, other SVOD channels and mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna see, we're only gonna see more and more aggressive competition in the SVOD market. Um, but also, you know, actually the, the Netflixization of, of the genre has created competition and audiences in the theatrical market that we haven't seen before. Documentaries are doing really significant box office, not a huge number of them, but a handful of them yep. are doing box office now that we haven't kind of seen before. Yep. Um, and equally, a lot of the big cable channels, particularly the ones that are kind of associated with new SVODs, uh, like HBO, for mm -hmm. example, um, have to produce more content now. You know, they, they've, they've got a mandate to produce more content mm -hmm. to compete with Netflix, fundamentally. Good, we'll come back to some of that. Danny, I'm gonna to come to you. There was a period early in the year when Fire Festival was the, you know, it wasn't a, a drama that had been made for four million pounds, four million dollars an hour or whatever it was. There was a period when the buzz, the, net, the Netflix show was, was Fire Festival. Mm -hmm. That's quite a powerful thing for a, a, a sort of feature doc. Yeah, I mean, I think to kind of iterate a little bit more on Simon's point, um, you know, Netflix has created this market for documentaries that's just exponentially larger than what I think previously existed in that space, but in a lot of ways it also revealed that there is this audience for documentaries that's, I think, even larger than anybody realized. And you know, it's not that Netflix suddenly decided they just really like documentaries and they want to commission a lot of them. It was, um, I think, very early on when they really started to acquire, they realized that documentaries were performing exceedingly well on the ser service and I think a lot more so than they even originally expected them to perform on the service. And, yeah, um, I think what it uncovered, you know, to me, if you really want to break it down, it's one of the major effects of the Netflixization of content is that people watch a lot more content and people can make their choices of what content they're watching based on just time in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, you're, you're not paying per view, you're not dealing with when a broadcaster chooses to air something, you really just have this access to this library and the only um, bandwidth question in terms of what people are choosing to watch is you know, the hours that they have and um, people are watching a lot more content than they watched before. Mm -hmm. And when you suddenly take out the, you know, the choice of what broadcasters are choosing to give you at a given time or the money that you have to choose to spend to watch something a la carte because you're buying it you know, through an electronic sell-through service mm -hmm. or you're buying a DVD or paying to see something in a the theater, um, you know, the, the number of documentaries that people have chosen to watch is just really ramped up relative to when you take out all those other factors. Yeah. And, and young audiences as well. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, this is, it's, that, that's something I feel that's, that's, that's changed a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, and, I, you know, and, if, and if you really want to break down, well, why, when you take out all those other X factors and people can just choose the content that they want, why are they choosing documentaries, I think? You know, there's just great character. There's always been great character stories in these things. And... Um, when you start to democratize the opportunities of what to watch, mm -hmm. um, you know, suddenly those things can really just rise up to the same level as a $40 million or $400 million extravaganza because people just want good character stories at the, the end of the, the day. The form has evolved as well, which I guess is what we're here to talk about. I mean, it's, it's been slowly evolving, but the way in which documentaries now sort of borrow, and they have for some time, but that more and more borrow from drama and mm -hmm. cinema, you know, uh, and can be sort of, you know, hugely kind of narratively mm -hmm. and emotionally satisfying mm -hmm. pieces of work. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think I think when audiences come to choose between the vast array of, of, of fiction uh, and, and and then some some very very kind of powerful documentary offerings, they often go to go to the nonfiction. We'll we'll, we'll certainly come on to that. Naveen, I wanted to come to you. Um, you work for well, you work for Channel Four News. Effectively, yeah. uh, a traditional broadcaster. We're hearing a lot. Netflix is, is responsible for, yeah. for some of these changes. Um, somewhere along the line, Channel Four News, uh, um, which is uh, you know a, a news bulletin fundamentally about short stories mm -hmm. from all around the world, offering a digest. There was something um, in the ether that made you guys think we need to go deeper and dive into a into a single story. So there's a, there's appetite amongst. Um, all types, all types of viewers for in-depth yeah. storytelling. I mean, I think with um, from Channel 4 News' point of view, we have a, 
we're a conventional bulletin, but we also we're longer than other um, news bulletins, and we do more experimental stuff in the storytelling. Um, we have more opportunity to do, say, 10-minute pieces rather than just short traditional news things. And that's res uh, the result of that is that we've got, um, we found talent, we found filmmakers. Um, I used to be the foreign editor there, and during that time, the Arab Spring kind of changed the way we did foreign news. Um, there was a lot of, it was a very accessible wall. People could get there. Um, they, the technology changed, so it used to be huge cameras. Suddenly, people were filming on small cameras. They were more affordable. And as a result, I think a lot of new talent came up and uh, through our newsroom, and I know it's true of others, um, we've, we've nurtured um, quite inexperienced filmmakers who've, who've ended up making documentaries. And Wad is, um, uh, you know, is the most recent and, and somebody that we've really worked with um, while she was in Aleppo, um, we, we actually consciously cut her pieces with her, but in a very different way. We wanted to make sure that her, she was sending us rushes, and we wanted to make sure that we cut them in a way that captured people's imagination and um, kind of used documentary techniques, actually, because it was sort of year five or six of the Syrian war, and mm. it's very hard to keep audiences engaged. So we consciously decided to focus on characters and sort of little mini vignettes, um, which has then led to this film, so. Excellent. Um, Dan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you. I'd like to ask you about scale, mm. because a lot of what we're talking about is the opportunity to do bigger things. Does that, does that opportunity that's, that's emerged, does that impact on the choice of subject matter? I mean, we're, we're here to predominantly talk about leaving Neverland. You know, you are doing an investigation into one of the most famous people on mm. earth. That's obviously a project of scale. Are you sort of eased towards things where it has to be something of scale? Is there still scope to do smaller, more, um, less well-known stories? I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of, it's how you tell them, isn't it? So you could all, do almost anything as a sort of feature documentary if, you, if, if, if it had had enough. I think what, you know, the reason why I'm thinking as a viewer, why do you, why do you, why do you want to watch like a four hour film about anything? <laughs> A documentary about anything, and it's, it's I think it's that chance to sort of really slide into someone else's world and, and sit there and sort of really immerse and sort of forget about the rest of your life and 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 really start to go on a journey with the characters in that. Whether it's Game of Thrones, whether it's Making a Murderer, whether it's Leaving Neverland, it's that people I, people I think relish that, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's also I think it also speaks to authenticity. Authenticity is someone, something that, you know, it's, it's a commodity that's in increasingly short supply in, in a world where a lot of informa information is sort of so commoditized and so packaged. Something that feels not packaged, like, you know, for our film consisting of mm -hmm. nine interviews and some aerial shots and some archive, you know, is, um, it, it feels, I, I guess it has a certain value that people come to. But I mean, I'm just think, listening to these guys and thinking, you know, if in 2012, 2013, I'd gone to a commissioning editor and said, okay, we didn't do a, like it's a four hour film and it's interviews and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think that conversation would have lasted more than It would have been a short conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, for, in, in and of itself, the fact that Leaving Neverland is four hours says something about where we're at at the moment in terms of appetite for... for yeah, film, yeah, I think, I think, you know, people, there is a real appreciation of, of long form, documentary as a sort of almost like a cinematic form and people have the big TV sets and the great audio and you know the cameras have changed since 2012 you know the technology has leapt forward um, and and you know we have composed music and, and really as Simon said using the tools of cinema mm. to beguile and to draw people into you know, the world of the movie in a way that we just couldn't before. Mm -hmm. Poppy you, you, your sort of your take on that in terms of you, you know you've worked on lots of it that scale and opportunity feels greater than ever. Absolutely I mean I think um it's actually interesting listening to these guys and thinking about, you know, the fact that audiences are coming to documentaries no matter what the length, you know. I mean, there's all this talk about, you know, people having short attention spans now and, you know, there's Quibi and there's YouTube and mm -hmm. there's all these sort of very short form platforms. And actually, you know, to give credit to the viewers in all of this, people, you know, are wanting, you know, four hours or you look at the OJ, you know, whether mm -hmm. we call that a feature doc or not, you know, people flock to that. Um, and I think, you know, whether something has a theatrical life these days is, unfortunately for us, being, you know, people who love seeing our films in the cinema, becoming a bit less important. And mm -hmm. as long as a film 
aspires to the cinematic sensibility, it can still, you, you can still give someone that sort of theatrical experience, even if they're watching it on a small screen. Mm -hmm. I don't like to think people are watching it on a screen that big, but I'll take that. <laughs> a telly, a telly in their telly. house. <laughs> um, can we be very non-British and talk about money for a little bit? I wonder whether, you know, is the ambition that we've been talking about, the scale that we've been talking about, translated into chunky budgets? And also I wonder whether there used to be an idea that kind of single docs or, or doc, feature docs sort of maybe just about wash their face in terms of kind of, you know, breaking even. Uh, I don't know. Is, is, is there more money sloshing around in the, in the, in the sector? Dan, tell me. I mean, <laughs> you, know, I, I mean you know, I sold your, you've sold your film yeah. everywhere, we said at the start of the session. Yeah, I mean, you know, not, not, every, not every feature doc we do is going to be a Leaving Neverland. Um, you know, I think that was, that's a pretty unique once in a, maybe once in 10 years, once in a lifetime. But yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a feel, the, the world is, is much more open for producers. Um, it is the time, it's, a, it's definitely a golden era. I think it's been a golden era in documentary for the last you know, 10 years, really. It's been incredible. Technological developments I was talking about earlier that make, make it easy for you to do these sort of pieces with ambition and scale. Um, and so I think, yeah, we're, British producers are living in a completely different world. You know, we had great public service broadcasting, you know, Channel 4 and BBC, but suddenly it's like, oh, there's all these other uh, you know, buyers, obviously, and, and you, can, you can dare to dream big. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it is a new era in that way. I think we've always, we've always thought, I speak for myself, we've always thought quite small mm -hmm. because, you know, you're told, oh, you're lucky to be making this, you know, with your 150 grand budget or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it turns out that other people are interested in watching that kind of material. It, so wasn't, it feels like it wasn't that long ago that people were slightly wringing their hands and saying, oh, the, we're worried about the death of the single doc. Mm. Uh, kind of on, on, on PSB television, and now that narrative seems to have completely flipped on its, yeah. on its well, head. I would say it's quite a sort of polarised world in a way, because you, you go to sort of European film festivals and sort of talk about, sit on panels and talk about how much money there is sloshing around for docs, and you kind of get a sense that the audience is just kind of like sort of quietly seething. You yeah. know? <laughs> um, so I don't think we should pretend that it's easy for everyone. <coughs> the truth of the matter is it's become much easier to finance a certain kind of doc, and there are many, And tell many me about more. that certain kind of doc, then. What, yeah, I mean... What, what criteria does that certain kind of well, doc Well, it, it, it depends, but, but I guess the, the docs that we've been, been involved in, or, you know, we're talking about on this panel, Big might, might, might be those kinds of docs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, our, our Weinstein um, doc, Untouchable, which I guess we're going to talk about, um, you know, was not difficult to finance. I mean, it actually... Uh, the BBC came on board in, in the first instance. It was kind of their idea, actually. Um, and um, quite quickly, actually, I sort of hooked up with a theatrical sales agent, and they, they sent incredibly robust sales projections ahead of Cannes. They took the film to Cannes, and it pre-sold to almost everyone um, based on, you know, a couple of pages of, of A4. Um, and, um, and then it sold to Hulu at Sundance. So... Yeah, that, that, that commercial model, you know, the sort of pr theatrical pre-sales market mm -hmm. for docs is fairly new, I would say. I mean, uh, we did a doc called... Yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I, and I think to Simon's point, there, there is a lot more money and opportunity slashing around, especially for particularly noisy subjects where, you know, whether it's a subject that um, is about a topic people already know or it's about something where... Even if it's a topic people don't know, but there's clearly a noise factor to what the pitch is, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more money and opportunity for those kind of projects, especially if there's kind of a name figure or a, you know, a really well-known topic at the surface of it. You know, I think there's still a pretty wide and vast world of you know, documentaries that are still kind of fighting the game of getting financed through grants and little bits of equity here and there. And, you know, that's for lots, lots of times, I think, a lot of more tougher and left of center mm -hmm. subjects. I mean, I think it's no coincidence that of the four films effectively represented here, three of them are based on stories where people coming to watch those films either already have a view or have a decent understanding of what it is they're about to see. So um, by the time Untouchable is, is released, people are aware that, um, and Poppy reminded me, I should probably use the word allegedly, that Weinstein is allegedly a horrible sexual predator and a pretty <laughs> repugnant human being, as well as being an important figure in the movie world. But they, they know, they have a feeling about Weinstein. Michael Jackson, 
I know there are some Michael Jackson truthers out there who <laughs> believe, Dan, that you are pretty much the Antichrist. But and covering up for Harvey Weinstein as well. And covering for Weinstein, so stop that. Um, but, you know, people come to that. Danny, your film is called Fire Festival, The Greatest Party That Never Happened. So there's something there around. <coughs> These are all big stories that are out there where what you're doing as filmmakers is unpicking and trying to understand the whys and the wherefores rather than necessarily telling untold tales. Is that, I mean, is that, is that the direction that the market's moving in, do you think? To, to a great extent, but there are always, and this is the reason why we, we love what we do is because there are always great surprises. I guess Four Summer is, is a surprise. I mean, I did, I, as you said earlier, I was involved in Searching for Sugar Man, which is an obscure little historical footnote and, you know, a story that was very difficult to market because it's about a, a singer who everyone thinks is dead. Um, you don't want to kind of reveal that he's not. Um, so that was a film that actually really benefited from, from having a, a theatrical release in the US, Sony Pictures Classics. Mm -hmm. You had to un unfold that film carefully and, you know, and kind of curate it. And, and that sort of theatrical model can be incredibly helpful. And I kind of wonder whether, you know, the film would have had the life it had had it been acquired by Netflix. You know, mm. it might not have. Mm. Um, so... You know, I, I just I do think there are lots of kind of exceptions, but yes, certainly the kind of the obvious commercial ones are just that much easier to sort of I'm raise the money. Probably I'm conscious that you know you worked on three, <coughs> three identical strangers, yes. in a different, a different capacity, but you worked on that. That's not a, you know, that that is well, more of a kind of. I guess that comes into the category of um, sort of stranger than fiction yes. story mm. and. I tend to think... Um, are those kind of things a harder sell these days? Or? Oh, I think these days, that's what everyone wants, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I tend to think that the, the kind of successful feature docs are either about well-known names like Michael Jackson or Weinstein or Amy or, you mm -hmm. know, somebody where you know you're going to get an audience. The bar is set very high to, for you to then deliver something mm -hmm. sort of better and, and worthy of, you know, the, the money spent and the, um, the cinemas booked and, and everything. But... Um, and then I think you have the, yeah, the kind of stranger than fiction kind of jaw-dropping story, which actually Fire Festival is as well, you know, where you just, you, you, you know, you're kind of expecting, well, you don't know what to expect, but, um, you know, you will be surprised at, at various moments along the way, and the story will stand up against the very best of, you know, scripted films. Mm. And then I guess you have the, um, the sort of smaller stories, but that have really strong universal themes and told in a really confident narrative way. And I think Force Hammer really fits into that where, you know, it's it's just a sort of stunning piece of storytelling. It doesn't necessarily have the production values that, yep. you know, we all sort of shower our projects in, you know, beautiful cinematography and amazing composers. And because, you know, when you can, you obviously want people to have that experience. But... You don't have to have that, and I think Full Summer is, is an example of that. I, mean, I think it's interesting with Full Summer, and some of the films we're talking about, and lots of the high profile feature docs, mm -hmm. are very much films with a kind of a point, a point of view or an editorial line. And obviously, Full Summer has a point of view, yeah. but it isn't it, the fact that uh, it's, uh, it has a degree of um, sort of balance to it. It's not necessarily a political film being made by a, a director with a. No. A, a sort of yeah, I mean, message to convey. It's very much, uh, you know, her story, and she worked with a uh, more experienced feature doc editor, uh, um, director Edward Watts, and together they did this. But it's Ward filmed everything that's in that in the film. She chose what to film. Um, you know, she's an Arab woman, very young. She's only 28 now, and she's gone through. You know, the film depicts a quite an ordinary life that then becomes kind of out of control and she sort of made some extraordinary decisions but she's someone that you can you can kind of identify with her but then she sort of makes these choices that are um, kind of incredible and I think there's a um, there's something there that you just you, you kind of you know you, you hold on to and you you're kind of taken for a ride in a way you kind mm -hmm. of you want to know what happens you want to know who survives you obviously know she does um, but you don't know about her child, her um, husband, her friends. And, um, and I think one of the things, and this is a slightly different point, but one of the things that really 
it was very important to, to, to us at Channel 4 News and Channel 4 and to her was it was no one was telling her story. She, this was her story. She was, um, you know, when, when you've got a woman protagonist, it's very easy to make it into kind of a cliche love story because people always want women to be about love and, and babies and things. And, um, and war is a very male space and Ward kind of defies all these things. And, um, and that was very important that this story, it is a love story, but it's a love story to a leper. It's a love story to a daughter. And obviously her husband, she meets him there and he's a big character in the film, but it's actually about um, a woman doing something very different. She's not a victim, she made conscious decisions and I think that, that was very important to us. And I think it's helped with audiences. Good. Um, I would like to talk about each of the films in, in, in turn now. So um, we're gonna begin by talking about uh, Leaving Neverland. I wonder if we can run the clip for Leaving Neverland, please. So, Dan, let's talk about some of the creative choices that you made with that, mm. with that film. It is fundamental. You, you took a decision to have a very tight focus on the victims and, and, their, and their families, mm. um, almost to the exclusion of a kind of other elements. What, what was behind that choice and the, the desire to sort of, I don't know, tell what might be considered to be one side of the story? So there, I mean, there, there are two forces at play. One is the storytelling, the filmmaking considerations. And I, I began to realize once we got the mums on board that you, know, you had mother-son, mother-son, you had this, these amazing pairings. And, and for me, the story was very much about you know, what the hell were the mums thinking? Because that was the first question that any woman I showed that we did have this half-hour sizzle that we made before HBO came on board. And that, you know, every, every time, loads of people said, Where, what about the mothers, what are they thinking? So that was, in a way, the central question of the film. How mm. could these children have been delivered into the, into the clutches of, of Jackson? So there was a storytelling consideration. And there's also a journalistic consideration, which is basically what we're talking about is are events that happen behind closed doors between only two people, one mm -hmm. of whom is dead. Um, and so when you talk about involving, I mean, you know, we did, we did consider involving investigators and I mm -hmm. did a bunch of interviews with investigators, but they are, they are saying what they know very much from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and they're piecing together, together clues and you know, they're interviewing and, and kind of none of that was new and none of it was really sort of decisive. And you know, what we had that was new and really earth shattering was the young men, then children, who had actually been in Michael's bed for night after night after night after night, telling you what they knew. Um, and there was really no one else with direct knowledge of those events. So let's talk a bit about, so um, let's talk a bit about the, the victims and their families. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about approaching them and getting them on board and how you convince someone to talk about those kind of events, that both the, 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 the two boys as were and their the, the families, but also the way in which you chose to sort of shoot those interviews um, and some of the techniques uh, involved in doing that. Mm. Well, I think getting the guys on board was, was um, I mean, everything sort of really hinged on, on the, f the first and only face-to-face -face meeting we had before we began filming. And, um, and I think, you know, at that point, both Wade and James had decided that they probably were, if they, if they liked me and if they thought I was honest, they were going to maybe do a documentary. Um, and what astonishes me is like... Were they in touch? Were they, were they having those conversations Between independently? Themselves? Yeah. No, I mean, they, didn't have, they couldn't have any contact. Um, and they didn't actually until... And they had a lunch together, I think, in 2014, but under, under their lawyer's supervision. But they didn't actually meet until Sundance properly and get to and spend time together. So no, they weren't talking to each other, but they were, they were, they were talking to their lawyer. They had the same lawyer. And, and I think, you know, must have talked to their wives and, you know, thought about it a lot before they met me. And when they met me, we sort of looked each other in the eye and I was, you know, I think I said, look, if we're gonna make this film, you have to, you have to go there. You have to, we have to know what actually happened in the bedroom. Um, and we can't flinch from that. And, and, uh, and, and, and they were also really up, what was motivating them was the idea of doing something that a lot of other people who've had the same experience could, could watch and you know, might allow them to then mm -hmm. think about or speak about their experiences. So um, it, in a way it wasn't, I wouldn't say it wasn't difficult, but you know, it, was, it could have gone horribly wrong at the first face-to-face -face meeting and that, that was it. And once we got past that hurdle, then, then it was a matter of just listening to them for days and days and days. 
and, and there's a lot of footage a of lot them of, talking. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> talk, so talk to us about that, about uh, there, there, there are different ways to get interviewee subjects, and we'll, we'll come on to this. The interviews play quite a key part in many of these films. To, to, to uh, you know, how you um, instigate yeah. uh, an, an interview and, and, and the volume of footage that you... That you yeah, think. I mean, I used to... I've, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, and um, I, I used to put a great thought into it and think about all the questions, and, and you know, which I obviously still do to some extent, but I, I guess a lot of it has become kind of unconscious. Um, so I'm not really aware of really preparing that much for an interview. Um, I, I think of it as just you sit the person down and they tell their story, and then any bits you don't understand or any bits you want to challenge, you go back, you, you know, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. You just have to create that space around them where they, they feel listened to mm -hmm. and they feel understood. And so if, you, know, you need to do a certain amount of background research, I suppose, in order to be able to understand what it is they're telling you. Mm -hmm. um, but on a grand, you know, for, forgive me, on a granular level, were they... Were you interviewing them for hours at a time, or multi, you know you were doing lots of interviews no, for so short, the, short duration? Or the way it tell worked. Us, tell the way us about it worked. That. Um, so you know, I'd got in touch with Wade and James's lawyer. I flew to LA to have a meeting with him. It, eventually, Wade and James both said, "Yeah, fine, we'll meet Dan." And then very quickly um, after that, I flew to. Um, so I'd met James, then went to Hawaii to meet Wade, had lunch with him. Then we started. You know, next day we did three days of of back, you know, back to back interviews. Um, so it's like hours eight, at eight, end. eight or now eight or nine hours a day, just sitting there and just talking. And you're trying to make that conversational, and you're trying to make that non confrontational. Yeah, I mean, I've, or uh, are you having to push these guys beyond what? Some, they want? Sometimes, I mean, there was a moment, for instance, um, when he said he's talking about um, going on the witness stand in the in the criminal trial of, of when Michael Jackson was tried for child molestation and. And he said, Michael didn't t touch me, which is one of the big sort of, like, what the fuck's in the film. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Wade said, I wasn't able to tell the truth. You know, I, I couldn't tell the truth. I w and I said, no, well, you lied. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and, and um, I mean, he thought about it for a bit. Um, and then he sort of went away for a, had a walk and sort of collected himself and came back. And, and, and then we talked about it again. And he said, I lied. You know, which is, I, I think you couldn't, I, you couldn't show any, you couldn't, like, um, accommodate the interviewee because, because this had to be a story that was told in, in, in a quite a sort of brutally honest way. Otherwise, it wouldn't stick. It wouldn't be credible. Mm. So we couldn't humor um, the people in the film. And, um, and so, yeah, I went back over everything. But, I mean, in the main, my main note to Wade was I told him, I, I said, can you please talk to me as you would to someone who knows nothing about psychotherapy and nothing about the law? Um, just, and I think he found that process of, you know, for the first time, talking in ordinary language yep. to someone. He found that incredibly transformative. Very quickly before I move on, there's also quite a lot of very impressive archive material yeah. in there, and use of that's quite interesting, and 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 um, showing the away from the terrible abuse, just how weird and wonderful it was to be part of Jackson's life at yeah. that time for those. Yeah. For those a lot of that, some of that came from their own private collection. Yes, and, I, I, and the, I mean so. the still photographs are amazing, and came through in kind of dribs and drabs as we were. James and Wade began to trust us a little bit mm. more. Um, and then, you know, qu quite a lot of it, a surprising amount, was, was from, you know, public archives. Right. And, you know, Jack, it, I think people forget how common it was to see Michael Jackson running around with holding a little boy by the hand or, you know, in the company of a, of a, of a child. And, of course, you see all those pictures very differently uh, in, through the lens of the story. Very good. I'm going to move on. Sure. Danny, we're going to talk about um, the Fire uh, Festival um, doc. A really interesting documentary, um, lots of different themes um, at, at play, um, tells the tale of a sort of steady march towards an impending disaster. But unpicking that is really, really interesting. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the sort of the, the narrative of the film in terms of easing the viewer towards this, this car crash. Um. It's interesting. So, you know, we lucked out in that we had a really phenomenal director on the film, Chris Smith, who we had just worked with uh, right before that film on our Jim Carrey documentary, Jim and Andy. And, you know, I, I always call Chris a little bit of a silent killer because 
I think he's, you know, he's a genuinely nice guy and he's a very sensitive guy. Um, he's very quiet and mm -hmm. he really just takes things in and um, I think he pays attention to very small details and things. And, you know, he's genuinely interested in people. And, you know, the way we came to the story in the first place was uh, Vice News, our news division, had been doing a lot of reportage on the fire Festival, actually before the festival, e festival even fell apart. So right. there was a series of articles that um, this one uh, reporter, Gabby Bluestone, who's the first interviewee in the film, yep. had been putting out for a number of months. And um, I think to some extent, because Chris and I were looking at those articles coming out in real time, and um, we were actually following the story before um, everything kind of came to a head and fell apart. You know, to some extent, our experience of taking in the story ourselves was really fed to us through, um, you know, kind of almost in real time as, yeah. as things were happening. And then um, when we were beginning our process on that film, you know, we, we lucked out early on because Gabby was able to say to us, hey, here's 20, 22 people that I interviewed as sources on these articles if you want access to them. We reached out to them. Pretty much everybody said they would sit down for an inter interview initially. We shot out the first um, 20 or so interviews pretty much in a weekend, um, right when we started the project. And just hearing those initial people tell the story of how they came to the company, how they got yep. sucked in, how things continued to drag along and seem like a reality, even in the face of falling apart, I think that really dictated a lot of the direction in terms of where that project went. And we ended up interviewing, I think, over 80 people right. um, for that project. So a lot of those initial interviews you know, a lot of them made it into the film, a handful of them didn't make it into the film, but I think one of the things that became crystal clear to us pretty quickly was just how consistent people's experiences were from, you know, whether it was people that worked directly for the company, people that were vendors working with the company, mm -hmm. people that were attendees, there, there was just this, these layer upon layer of experience from all these different perspectives that really showed us how people got sucked into something that really had no ground to stand on or basis from the get-go, but you know, people honestly believed in this yeah. thing and you know, continued to go along for the ride because they there's, were taking it at truth. There's an interesting balance there between people, sort of complicity mm -hmm. and duplicity. You know, some yes. of these people were duped. Some of them potentially were complicit or they were kidding themselves or trying to ignore the, the, the voice in, yeah. in, in, in their ear. That, I mean, that's quite an interesting balance to to, to strike in the in, in the film. It doesn't, beyond Billy, no. it doesn't really point too many fingers. And, and I honestly, I mean, we, we interviewed so many people for that film and heard so many consistent stories and people talking about the other characters involved that I, I honestly believe that there was a lot of complicity, but not a lot of duplicity. And Billy was really good at compartmentalizing um, his actions so that people would feel like, hey, there's an exposure point here. I'm in deep, I need to help. And people would be complicit in helping, which I think in a couple cases, and I, and I do feel like we tried to jab the knife at them a few times. Mm -hmm. there, there are a few people who I think ultimately were duplicitous in their complicity and we call them out for it. But mm -hmm. you know, I think there's complicity, duplicity, and then there are real victims. And sure. I think that when that story first came out, people were saying, oh, look at all of these funny millennials who got taken for a ride and paid money for this thing and showed up and you know, they deserved it and they laughed at them. And our experience when we really went through all the different characters was, you know, there were real victims. It wasn't the millennials who paid a lot of money for the ticket. It was the Bahamians who really thought this was gonna bring money into their community and a real opportunity. And it was actually many of the employees of the Fire Corporation who, you know, signed up for something that they believed was a legitimate company. They had a real app that they believed in. They were real investors, that, mm -hmm. that guy Calvin who, um, actually was one of the people who takes down the festival is, was one of the big investors in the app. And um, they, you know, there were a lot of people that really believed in what they were doing. And, and I think for us, there, you know, it was connecting back to a few things, which are, um, you know, whether you're a creative person putting yourself out there in the world to go and make something happen, or you work at a startup, or you work in a very established position, you're a politician, whatever it is, there's a lot of, things that happen in this world where people really have to take a chance, take a big deep breath, take a big belief, push themselves over a cliff in order to make something happen and you know, hope that it works out okay. And you know, generally what happens in this world is when you take those big chances, either 
um, they don't work and time forgets them or they work out spectacularly and those are the big gambles and the big wins that work for people. And this is, I think, a very, and it does happen, but I think it's, a, it's kind of a rarity where people put themselves out in a big way, mm -hmm. it, it fails miserably and it gets a lot of attention around it. Mm. Um, and to some extent that was, I think, of their own making in this case because they spent so much time selling the hype around the thing and actually did an excellent job on that part before yeah. the thing actually happened that when it blew up spectacularly. They're amazing brand builders, they yeah. just didn't actually do any work. I, I almost wanna, you know, I, I don't think I would actually hire anybody that was involved, <laughs> but you know, in a different world, in a different path, I could see those people actually being the kind of people you would wanna hire to promote something. Um, but you know, the other thing that I think for us was really important, and we purposely wanted people to draw their own conclusions on it, and not hit the nail, not hit people over the head with it, was this notion of, you know, in this world of fake news and Trump and Brexit and um, people that are not experts in a particular area, or people that have very dubious claims in a certain area, using the power of social media and the democratization of information as a means of authority, we felt like the, the film. Um, you know, really, we really wanted to pick that apart of the film and draw parallels without actually directly drawing any parallels, which I think is one of the reasons why the film actually was much more timely and important in a way than just a wacky mm. situation that happened out there. And the idea of selling a lie is sort of what you're talking about, exactly. which is basically transferred into the political arena in lots exactly. of different areas. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move on and, and talk to Poppy and Simon. Um, sure. About, un, about Untouchable. I wanted to talk to you a little bit. It's interesting, this is a film where journalism has led the way in advance of you, 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 you making this film. There was the very sort of high profile um, exposés uh, uh, done of, of, of Weinstein. And then the challenge creatively is to add something more on, on, on top of that. I wonder if you could probably talk to us a little bit about how you guys tried to address that, that challenge. Should we watch the Trailer. I beg your just pardon. Just because I'm conscious you, that I, people I, here won't have seen it. So. Do you know what? I'm, I need to apologise, Danny. I think I probably missed, good, good missed the fire festival. It actually uh, comes out on the BBC on September the 1st, so nobody's probably had a chance to watch it unless they were at Sundance, but <laughs> it might, might be helpful to. So, uh, Danny, my apologies to you. I wonder if we can... I, this is going to be a challenge for the technical guys. Are we able to um, skip this? We're already running short on time to the um, untouchable clip, please. Is that possible? Tell us about moving on from the, you know, this journalism, a story's broken and you guys need to move on from there for the, for the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was a really interesting challenge, you know, because you could sort of sit back and think, oh, there's so much reporting and we knew the reporting would continue and, it, you know, it continues to this day. But, um, you know, I guess there's two sort of ways we looked at it. One is you have to elevate it above that journalism and do something different with it and, Although the reporting was excellent and very in-depth, there's nothing like seeing people on screen and listening to their voices and looking them in the eye and kind of giving them a, a platform to tell their story, you know, with more space in a, in a different environment. So, um, you know, I think you do take away a you know, very different experience than reading um, mm -hmm. the journalism. The other thing with this story is that the journalism is part of the bigger story. And it's not just one reporter. There were a number of reporters over the years who tried to break it. And then the sort of process that both the New York Times and the um, New Yorker were going through as they were sort of going up against um, Harvey and his team, you know, that was all a kind of really interesting element that we wanted to bring into the documentary. So How it had um, been suppressed for so exactly long. Exactly, how it had been the... suppressed and then, you know, how it broke and, and what it meant to the women who came out because most of the women we interviewed came forward after the journal, after the stories had broken. And so, you know, to hear them talk about reading their own story in a newspaper, almost word for word, how they would have described it is, was extraordinary, you know, and it, that's what, I mean, that's why the Me Too movement and why, you know, this sort of whole thing changed is, you know, because of that journalism. And I, I asked Dan some questions about the interviews and the filming of those interviews. I don't know if there's, if, if you're able to give some context for, for untouchable in terms of the, the, the way in which when you're dealing with subjects, contributors, and asking them to 
relive the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Yeah, no. I mean, can, can I talk about something else? Actually? <laughs> because um, that, that's probably best handled by Ursula and Pompey. But, but, but you know, when, when the first the project sort of first came sort of into my sort of orbit, it was actually, as I said earlier, it was Simon Young who sort of I ran into at a conference and he sort of suggested it. And to be honest with you, my first reaction was sort of trepidation. It's like, you know, everyone was talking about this story. It was like mm -hmm. fresh. It was to, you know, literally every lunch, dinner. You know, no one wanted to talk. No one wanted to talk about anything else. And I guess my, my own sort of experience of, of Harvey, which is sort of limited, but I've sort of it, I, I've existed in in the orbit of independent film for for, for some time. And, you, you met know, him. I met him. Yeah, I, um, uh, and you know, uh, I've seen him in close quarters a lot. And he's this sort of he is this sort of totally fascinating. Figure. I've always been fascinated by him. He's like, utterly confounding. He's, you know, everyone knows he's a monster. I don't think anyone quite knew the extent to which he was a monster. Well, certainly I didn't, uh, or a lot of people didn't. Um, but he's also this kind of, this great kind of gatekeeper, maven of this, of, of, of sort of great cinematic art, you know, this kind of erudite figure who, who can, who mm -hmm. can, you know, so, so you kind of, you, you, I don't know a person who exists in the independent film world for a period who didn't want to, or wasn't up for working with Harvey in spite of everything that you knew or intuited about. And I think it was that kind of, that sort of paradox about this, this character. Um, and uh, combined with this sort of, you know, this, this sort of idea of power and how power operates or how it operated and the sort of limits of, of that power. Mm -hmm. um, and then added to that the kind of the mechanics of how that, that power was sort of allegedly deployed to abuse women and, and, the, and the nature of that abuse. And I sort of think, in a way, the form of the feature doc can kind of get to that, as Poppy said, actually, in a way that print really can't. You know, there's, there's, been, a, there's been reams and reams and reams of stuff written about Harvey, and some of it is quite nuanced and interesting, but somehow or other, sort of getting into telling that story, you know, in that way, telling the story of Harvey's career uh, and that the arc of that career and the arc of his power and, and uh, from the point of view of, of a whole host of characters at the center of whom are these women who, who are alleging that he raped or abused them. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the feature doc form can do in a way that n nothing else can. So I guess in the end, I sort of overcame my trepidation about the access and everything else that you, you know, you wonder about when you're embarking on a project like this. And a balance to strike between the film being a portrait of Weinstein versus an investigation into the environment in which he operated and yeah, sort of commenting it's, it's on more, the entertainment industry. It's more than just a portrait. It's a story of, of how the scandal sort of came to be, you know, but it's, it's very much within the context of, of his whole career. Um, that we tell that story, and indeed, you know, there's a woman in, in, in the trailer you just saw, the one who pauses for a great length of time, who, who is alleging that she was raped by him when, when he was in his 30s, I think. 20s, 20s, yeah. 20s, 20s right. But, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, even though the film is very much about Harvey Weinstein and the, the people that came into contact with him, he's sort of a conduit to explore, not the film doesn't do it, but to raise questions about the wider industry and society. But we felt, you know, you don't have time in a 90 minute film to, and it just doesn't work to sort of veer off into other Yeah, look, other an editorial focus gives it, gives it shape, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we are rapidly um, running out of time, so I'm gonna move on to, to Naveen to talk about um, to For Summer. Could we play the For Summer clip, please? And Naveen, the origin of this is kind of fascinating in terms mm. of what, as a, as a citizen journalist for, for Channel 4 News, tell us a little bit about the, uh, how this came to be. Um, well, we were looking for people there because we couldn't go into Aleppo at that point and it was really, um, the, the siege was, was about to start. It was clear that this was going to um, descend quickly and, and so we sort of decided to try and find um, someone who was there filming. Um, I was actually on maternity leave at the time, and so when I came back, I was told, oh, there's this woman in Aleppo, she sent in some footage, it was really good, can you, you know, help, can you, can you make it work? At that point, she didn't speak English, communications were very bad, and over time, we, we sent, um, she sent a producer to go um, to the border. At that point, she could move in and out of Aleppo, 
Um, and we, we sent a camera lens. Um, we spoke to her about how we wanted to try and craft the pieces. She was clearly very talented, um, but she wasn't trained. And what she was doing was filming everything. And a lot of what's in the film was actually shot before we met her. But she was doing it to keep a record of what was happening. And she knew that... Um, that so something in her, she had that sort of innate sort of absolutely. desire to be a storyteller uh, yeah, without absolutely. any technical yeah. training or any yeah. sort of... Yeah. Documentarian. She started on her phone in 2011. She was a student in Aleppo. That's where the, um, the protest started. Um, so she was doing that and she was just filming, 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 which is why when she eventually came out, we had over 500, probably more <laughs> hours of footage. Um, and it was all on bits of drives. And there was, you know, she didn't even know what she had. Um, and obviously the last six months when she was there was the incredibly intense um, period in that. And the, uh, as a result, we, when we initially cut the film, it was, a, it was chronological. And Ward was actually in vision in London talking about her experience and looking back on it. And we tried that. And after a while, we realised that that wasn't the, the best way of doing it because the main sort of point of difference of Ward, other than being a woman, was that she stayed till the very end. You know, she was on the last bus out. And there's been a lot of Aleppo films. There's been a very, very good Aleppo films that have been Oscar nominated. And uh, so we, we were kept trying to think, what is different? We knew, when, you know, when we saw her footage and when we were working with her at Channel 4 News, we knew she was incredibly talented. I've seen loads of brushes from people and I just knew this was incredible. But it was how, you know, it was a crowded field and it felt, we were worried a little bit about it being a bit late. You know, there's been all these films in Aleppo. What more can we say? But then it became clear, you know, pretty quickly that if we got the structure right and if we told the story in the right way, and this is what was um, brilliant about Ed and Ward together. When the edit started, she was in Turkey, he was in London. And they'd met once or twice, but it was very, very hard to do. But, you know, they, they did it. Um, but then when she actually came to London and they sat together, the whole sort of process changed. And suddenly we did a... We restructured it so that the siege became the focus. And then we flashed back to the early days rather than starting from the beginning because by... This was 2018. It felt already at that point like, they, you know, we've seen the early days of the Syria war. We know what happened. But actually what she captured at the end of the war, no one had really seen. So that was kind of... I mean, it's decision. authenticity, isn't it? It's sort of at the heart of this, really. It's interesting that mm. she began doing this not as a documentarian, well, not, well, not as a, what we might think of a documentarian, just as a, a, a person determined to capture what's happening to her home. And that sort of gives the film a, a quite an unusual she, um, sense about it. Yeah, and I think she... I mean, she says, you know, that a lot of camera people say this, that the camera kind of protects them from what they're seeing. So I think for her, it, was a, it gave her a bit of a distance to sort of what she was witnessing, and it was, it was horrific. Um, so I think she was doing it to keep a record, to, to give herself something to do. I mean, it sounds sort of pretty silly, but I think, you know, they were in the hospital. Her husband was working as a doctor there. She didn't go and chase the front lines. She didn't... She never wanted to do that. We never asked her to do that. Um, and as a result, I think what she captured was a sort of more interesting. Um, there's a scene in the film of um, a pregnant, a nine-month pregnant woman comes into the hospital. She's got shrapnel wounds on her stomach, and they take the, they do emergency uh, cesarean, and they try and revive the baby. And it's this, you know, excruciating watch, where, and, and everyone thinks the baby's going to die. And Ward just kept filming that, and I just, you never see that in a war zone. People don't film babies and doctors trying to revive babies they go to try and find where the yeah. rubble is and mm. where you know and, and it does have this amazingly sort of relatable quality it's mm. almost like what, you know what what your life would be like if london yeah. was under siege yeah where, and several people, people have said like that us, really, aren't they? yeah exactly they're yeah. very very um they're people you can identify with yeah. they're not um straight <laughs> they're not you know and and it is yeah that's what's i think yeah, has made it sort of universally the balance between the sort of... Dom it's both a, a, a war documentary mm. and a domestic tale, in fact, kind of... You see, uh, you see these very, this very ordinary, you know, young students full of hope and, uh, and that, and you see how life can change. And, and I know somebody watched it in, in New York at the, 
and he just said, God, this, I can imagine, this is what I imagine my life would be like if war came to New York. This is what, you know, and, and that's amazing. And, that, and we were so happy that people could um, connect with a film like that because, you know, it's very hard to get people to watch a, a film about war. <laughs> and it's slightly unfair of me to ask you to speak on her behalf, but do you have any sense of sort of Ward's ambitions now as a, as a, as a, as a sort of uh, film? She said to if, me, if the answer is no, then that's No, no, I mean, I think, she's, I think she's just had this incredibly intense experience. She's, she's living in London now. She's, she's doing a lot of promotion of the film. She's working with us. She, she craves a, a normal life. You know, she says, I want to come and work at Channel 4 News and go home and have... But, you know, she's... The world's opened up to her. She's talented. She's... Um, so I don't know, I think she would like to make another film, yeah. Can I ask one small thing? Mm. Please. The, the, the framing of the, I haven't watched it, I'm going to watch it definitely, but the framing of it as, as the sort of letter to her yeah. daughter, Fasama, where did that come from? That came from, um, actually came from her and, and Ed together, but I think when she was in Aleppo, even though she didn't know, she wasn't consciously making a film, she did... Um, she was very aware of the fact that she had chosen to stay with her daughter, and that's something in the film that audiences react to often quite, um, not violently, but, you know, you have a, an emotional yeah. a, a, a reaction to that. Um, so I think she always had the idea of trying to explain to her daughter why she stayed, and she actually did cut a kind of little mini version of um, a film to which part of that narrative was to her daughter, but it sort of came about at the end. Mm. It also works very nicely that the film isn't called Aleppo Under Sea. It's not got a literal title. It's got yeah. a slightly abstract title, which I think plays to that point. I'm conscious that we're already slightly a few, a few minutes over. I'm getting a, this signal, which I don't <laughs> think is a good sign. Um, that being the case, I wonder if you can join me in thanking the panel for their time. <laughs>